Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to this January 7, 2014 edition of Nightcast. And friends, as much as I would like to just boom right into this 60-second explanation of the South Sudan crisis, for, for you to be able to best understand it, I need to give you just a couple of sentences of explanation about this, because you're going to see a lot of titles on the screen in this little 60-second explanation of of the South Sudan crisis. At least 60,000, I'm sorry, I'm thinking 60 seconds, at least 1,000 people are believed to have died in clashes in South Sudan between rival army factions in a conflict escalated by ethnic undertones. President Salva Kerr says the violence started after a coup attempt blaming soldiers loyal to former Vice President Rick Macker for the trouble. Mr. Macker denies this. The BBC outlines the background to the crisis in 60 seconds. This video produced by Michael Hurst. Friends, more on South Sudan, but first let me mention to you that, yes, we will have coverage of today's extreme weather throughout the United States, but since many of you have probably dealt with that all day long, and you've probably seen on social networks this report and that report, we're going to save that for a little bit later in the program. We do want to have it for documentary purposes, for people looking back on this date, they can say, oh yeah, that, that was that terrible weather time. But these uh, stories related to the Red Horse are indeed significant, and I've got some of them up front. Now, related to this situation in the South Sudan, Sudan and South Sudan have begun talks over deploying a joint force to protect oil fields threatened by rebels. Sudan's foreign minister said, uh, reports this to us. Now, this news comes after Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir, flew to South Sudan to discuss the unrest with his counterpart, Salva, uh, his counterpart, Salva Kerr. Katharina Mo reports. After weeks of uncertainty, it seems some progress towards peace is being made. Meeting on neutral ground in Ethiopia's capital, the two warring sides in South Sudan's conflict begin face-to-face -face discussions for the first time, now that an agenda has been agreed upon. We are committed to peace, and from here I hope that we will be in a position to stop this death which is happening in our country, stop this displacement, and all the atrocities that are happening today in South Sudan. Fighting began three weeks ago in South Sudan. The country's president, Salva Kiir, accuses his former vice president, who he sacked last July, of attempting to seize power, an accusation Riek Machar denies. What began as a political dispute has spiraled into ethnic violence. The international community now fears the world's newest country is on the brink of civil war. 
On Monday, Sudan's president arrived in South Sudan's capital, Juba. It's his first official visit since violence began. In a joint news conference with President Salva Kiir, he made clear Sudan had no intention of supporting opposition rebels. We tried it with Chad. We tried it with Ethiopia. We tried it with Eritrea. We even tried it here with South Sudan. In the end, we reached the conclusion that these are all lost efforts, destructive actions that come to nothing. The two countries are considering the deployment of a joint force to secure oil fields claimed by both Sudan and South Sudan, a resource that rebels have been aggressively seeking to control. So far, they've taken two state capitals, including the town of Bor. Heavy fighting continues in and around that area. The UN says more than a thousand people have died in the conflict, and an estimated 200,000 have been forced to flee their homes. Many are taking refuge at UN bases. Hopes now pinned on peace talks between negotiators and finding a solution soon. Katerina Mo, BBC News. Well, friends, and uh, problems don't just happen overseas, and even terrorists are not simply a matter of overseas things. And a terrorist doesn't always look like a foreign pers person, as you'll see in this next story. A U.S. woman who joined a plot to kill a Swedish artist whose cartoon offended Muslims. The woman has been uh, the woman who joined forces on that has been sentenced to 10 years in prison. Katharina Mo. Well, before we go to the report, the, the the picture on your screen. This is Colleen LaRose, 50 years old. 50 year old Colleen LaRose who dubbed herself Yihad Jane, admitted in 2011 that she sought to kill Lars Vilks and she recruited others to the cause. Nada Talik reports. Colleen Rose forever changed the face of terrorism. As a middle-aged woman with blonde hair and green eyes, her appearance was nondescript and in her suburban town in Pennsylvania, she was just another neighbor. She looks like an everyday housewife. You know, she did la we did laundry and passed each other in the laundry room. So I'd say she would look like an everyday housewife. But online, Colleen LaRose was Jihad Jane. At her sentencing, she told the judge that she had been in a trance and thought about Jihad from morning to night. But her obsession became reality. In 2008, she plotted to travel to Europe and killed this man, Swedish artist Lars Vilks. She was instructed over email to shoot him six times in the chest for depicting the Prophet Muhammad as a dog. But she left Europe without coming face to face with him. Despite the threat, Mr. Vilks said she should be released. Well, I think that they, they actually should let her loose and, and they give her some therapy because I, th I think that, that, that she's in a bad state and actually this is a psychological case. Prosecutors have described Colleen LaRose as lonely and isolated. She came from a broken home and was raped by her father and then turned to drugs and prostitution. Prosecutors say she was looking online for a personal transformation. Seven others were indicted in the plot to kill Lars Vilks, two of them also in the United States. And the FBI has investigated hundreds of cases similar to that of Colleen LaRose. The Internet has become an easy place for extremists to recruit vulnerable individuals, and it shattered American perceptions of what a terrorist looks like. Netta Taufit, BBC News, New York. Okay, friends, and the... Uh more in the way of the Red Horse, concerns that sectarian conflict in Iraq could turn to civil war is our next story. There are fears in Iraq that the country is once again on the brink of a sectarian war. Some of the heaviest fighting in years is going on in the west of the country. Now Islamist militants who have taken over the city of uh, Fallujah, are urging Sunni tribes in the area to back them in their fight against the Shia-led government of Nuri al-Malaki. 
the sectarian conflict is reflected in the struggle for leadership of the insurgency in neighboring Syria. Mike Woolridge has this report. Iraqi government reinforcements on the way to Anbar after militants captured ground in the province and held it for the first time in years. They'll be joining other government troops who are battling a resurgence of Al-Qaeda-linked militancy and what appears to be an attempt to create a Sunni Muslim state straddling the frontier with Syria. The western Anbar province is seeing some of the heaviest fighting for years. Government troops are battling Al-Qaeda-linked militants known as the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. The fighting began last month in the town of Ramadi after government troops broke up Sunni anti-government protest camps. The town has been controlled by powerful Sunni tribes battling pockets of the fighters there. The Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant is also fighting government forces in Syria and it's being attacked in turn by other Syrian opposition groups in Raqqa province and the town of Aleppo. And this amateur video purports to show the clashes between Al-Qaeda-linked fighters and other rebels in Aleppo in the past few days. Analysts say that behind such clashes lies competition for the control of Syria's opposition-held areas and a desire on the part of some of the rebel groups to regain Western support after a suspension of aid. An NGO that monitors the fighting in Syria said today that at least 34 jihadists from the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, none of them Syrians, were killed after clashes with other rebel movements in Idlib province. So, on different fronts in two countries, there's now a new and complex element in the tension and fighting across this volatile region, reflected in Iraq in the standoff in Fallujah, fiercely fought over and currently resembling a ghost town. Aid for civilians who've been caught up in the clashes in Fallujah. Many have fled their homes in the town and in other places, caught up in this upsurge of fighting. And the US, among other nations, is expressing increasing concern isolating extremists seen as a priority now, and that's as much a political as a military issue. Mike Aldridge, BBC News. Thank you, Mike. And friends, uh, even though we're going to turn next now to several videos on the extreme weather that's been happening in the United States, and that's also happening cold weather spreading around the world as a result of it as well. And I have one of the best reports that explains why we're having this cold weather, the physical explanation for it from experts. But following that, now listen up, don't tune out saying I've seen all this weather stuff I want to see and it's making me shivering cold. And you know even between the news clips when I turn off the heater so you don't hear that sound, you know, uh, this room is uh, is, it cools off very quickly, even under the hot lights. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, you know, we're 10 degrees warmer tonight than we were last night, at least where I am. Thank the good Lord. But, uh, friends, after the news on the weather, I have some news out of China, and I have a report related to the EU and Cuba and our brother Zebulun's involvement, the tribe of Zebulun. Now, if you know who the tribe of Zebulun is, you know exactly who I'm talking about. If not, stand by for that. We'll reveal that, and we've got some interesting things to say about the impact that could have on brother Zebulun remaining in the European Union situation. So that's coming up after several of these videos on the weather. In this first one, we'll see how a brutal blast of Arctic air has settled over eastern North America, bringing dangerously low temperatures not seen in decades. About half of the U.S. population has been placed under a wind chill warning or cold weather advisory. Regina Vadyanathan reports from Washington. America's deep freeze. More than half of the country is enduring some of the coldest temperatures felt in decades. It's freezing, man. It's, it's cold. <laughs> oh, it's colder than it's been in like forever, but uh, I've got more layers than I've had on in forever. 
The cause of this unusually cold spell is what forecasters in the US are calling a polar vortex, an Arctic blast which has brought with it sub-zero temperatures. Days of snow have been followed by these high-speed gusts of wind. The result? Travel misery. Treacherous roads and thousands of flights cancelled. Trains were also brought to a halt. Hundreds of passengers near Chicago were forced to spend the night on board. You know, everybody's anxiety level kind of went up. You're unsure of the unknown. The water's frozen over here in the centre of Washington, D.C. It's so cold, I can barely feel my fingers. The thermometer here is giving us a reading of around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about minus 12 Celsius. But if you want to get an idea of how cold it really is, then take a look at this. We poured water on a T-shirt less than five minutes ago, and now it's completely solid. The mercury's been so low that parts of the east and midwest of the country have been colder than much of Antarctica. Doctors have warned people to stay indoors to avoid frostbite. Some have no choice, like postman John Willis. Got to have the face mask. Only problem is my mustache keeps freezing. <laughs> Schools and offices remained closed across large parts of the country. The crippling cold weather forecast to last, last for the next few days. Regina Vivianathan, BBC News, Washington. And dear friends, I know uh, some of you might have caught it in that video about how uh, a vortex has been explained as being involved. And I know some of you are saying, well, I hope, you know, they're using language that either they just trying to uh, trying to uh, skirt on the heels of global warning or things like that. But I've got a video coming up shortly, uh, in just a moment, a few moments, uh, where a weather expert is explaining this. And friends, I know that uh, it's true a lot of things from the liberal news give cause for concern over things that are said and, and the even the all of the claims of global warming had a lot of hyperbole to it and and is proving out <laughs> that here we are about to go into another uh, ice, mini ice age thing. Uh, and you know, somebody pointed out a scripture uh, on one of the online social networks today. Maybe I'll print that out and put it up on screen for tomorrow night. It shows how much that God is really involved over our weather and how he controls our weather. And I thought our camera almost froze up from, well, it did freeze up for a moment. I thought it permanently froze up. Thank you that it did not. But let's go for our next story. Uh, let me see, friends. This one, you know, they're describing these in the pretty much the same way in the lead ends, a brutal blast of, a little different, a brutal blast of Arctic air has settled over eastern North America, bringing, you know, that's the same lead-in. Different story I got here for you, though. But This one uh, is going to involve some video uh, under the BBC license provided by ABC News reporter Ryan Owens. So again, ABC, we're playing this under your permission to BBC and under their license, we're showing it to you here under the license we have with the BBC. Ryan Owens of, BB, of ABC said that Indianapolis was becoming a ghost town, or had become a ghost town, and that on Monday the governor uh, made driving in the state of Indiana illegal. Right now it is minus 25 degrees Celsius, and Indianapolis is essentially a ghost town. This place is shut down. At least the interstate behind me is open. Believe it or not, yesterday the governor here closed down the entire interstate system and told everybody to stay at home, that it would actually be illegal to drive on the interstate system here in the United States, at least in the state of Indiana, if you can believe that. So people are doing their best. They're mostly staying inside. Schools canceled, as you mentioned. Uh, most employers are not requiring people to come to work, so all of that is good. I want to update you also on a situation happening in Illinois, right next door to us, about 80 miles outside of Chicago, three trains operated by Amtrak, which of course operates the trains here in the United States, actually were stuck in a snowbank. This happened yesterday. 
uh, in the afternoon. And so people, more than 500 passengers, stuck on those three trains outside of the Chicago area for 14 hours. So I don't think I have to get too graphic here, but if you can think about the bathroom situation, the living conditions on site of that train, no thank you very much. A bad situation. The Amtrak has finally got some buses to those people and have started to rescue them. They will then be bused to Chicago, but the roads the whole way are a mess. The, air, uh, the airports are a mess as well. So the end of their journey still very much in, in doubt. Okay, thank you, and uh, dear friends, on our next report here, uh, and Dave, if uh, Kathleen is not there with you right now, go get her, because in this next report, Jacques Yeres, a, uh, a United States meteor meteorologist, explains what a polar, did I say, Dave, go get Kathleen now. If she's not with you, go get her. Because Jacques Yeres, a, a, a United States meteorologist expert, explains what a polar vortex is to the BBC's Katty K. Jackie, a polar vortex sounds like something out of a kind of bad horror movie. What exactly is it? Well, it's not a new term, actually, and the polar vortex is always out there. It just has to do with the location of where it is right now. Uh, it's basically just a circulation that's usually up around the North Pole, and it extends tens of thousands of feet into the atmosphere. So right now, the polar vortex is further south than it normally gets. It's up over the northern Great Lakes, and that's pulling in very cold Arctic air where millions of people happen to live. Okay, now I know there's a bit of a dispute about why it's coming here, but what, what are the prevailing theories? Well, you know, we get these variations in weather patterns all the time. So this may just be an anomaly more than anything else. It's happened before, and it's been about 20 years since we've seen temperatures this cold in this part of the country. But I read somewhere that it's happening more frequently, that it is picking up and that there's some theory about whether this is to do with the melting of the polar ice cap, and that's, you know, changing weather patterns. You can't put one weather event on global warming or that type of a long-term cycle. So we'll have to wait and see as we continue to see these variations if they do continue to to pick up. But we've, you know, it's been 20 years, so it hasn't been that frequent since we've seen something like this happen. Right. W what are we expecting to see here? Washington, D.C. is going to be hit by this cold blast tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What, what kinds of things are you expecting to see? What are you going to be worried about when you're reporting tomorrow? Well, you worry about anybody that's outdoors for a length of time. It could only take maybe 30 minutes in Washington, D.C. to get your skin frozen, or what we call frostbite. It's not as bad here as it's in other parts of the upper Midwest. Places in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan had wind chill factors in the 50s and 60s below zero this morning. And that's morning. just minutes your skin needs to be exposed and you could get that's frostbite. five minutes, yeah, up there. Here we'll see temperatures probably drop down in the single digits in our nation's capital tomorrow morning, but our wind chill factor will probably be somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees below zero at Okay, times. I know that when my cell phone is very cold, it seems to not work very well. <laughs> In fact, when I'm very cold, I don't seem to work very well either. But what kinds of things are going to be affected by the sudden drop in temperatures in terms of technology and transport and systems? Well, one of the concerns is we had rain this morning. The winds hopefully will dry most of that off, but any existing moisture certainly will freeze up, and that's going to create some icy conditions on the roads. Um, sometimes our homes aren't all that well insulated, so you have to watch out for frozen pipes or potential water main breaks. And then you just have to watch out for people and pets, people who could potentially lose power. Some parts of our area had a lot of freezing rain yesterday, and if any of that ice is still on the trees, we get these winds 20, 30, 40 miles per hour, and that could bring down some limbs and cause some power outages as well. We know, Jackie, that some people have already died because of these freezing temperatures. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it hypothermia that's the biggest risk to them? I would say so, and frostbite, that where the skin gets frozen and, and actually kills the skin. And, and how much longer is it going to last? When can we get back to more, <laughs> more mild temperatures here in the United States? Well, we're looking at a pretty decent shot of this cold air sticking around for a couple of days. It looks like in Washington, D.C., we won't get above freezing until Thursday afternoon. The upper Midwest won't get above zero until Thursday afternoon. Yeah. Okay, and there you are. And friends, I have, uh, and especially David for your wife here, I, I dug up another report, this one from ABC, and again through the BBC's licensing, which shows that uh, uh, another 
story related to the uh, polar vor vortex, uh, where potentially record-breaking low temperatures as a, as a uh, polar vortex brings more freezing weather. As shown in this report, temperatures in the north and central U.S. could feel, feel as low as minus 51 degrees centigrade. That would be minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit with the effect of wind chill involved, forecasters say. In this ABC News report, you'll hear how icebreakers have been deployed to Lake Michigan to clear the way for freighters. Dangerous and life-threatening. Air so cold, frostbite can attack in as little as five minutes. The wind chill in Minneapolis hitting a breathtaking negative 60 degrees. Lake Michigan frozen solid. Icebreakers there are being called in to clear the way for freighters. In Bloomington, Minnesota. My window froze up on the inside, so I had to scrape it off so I could see to drive home. Fire crews in Omaha, Nebraska, just praying their uniforms won't turn to ice. Once they get wet and that begins to freeze, it becomes a problem. Where it's not the cold, it's the relentless snow. Overnight, St. Louis slammed with the most snow they've seen on this day in more than 30 years. Dangerously slick roads and whiteout driving conditions from Oklahoma to Illinois, creating ice road turmoil. Even members of the Southern Illinois University men's basketball team found themselves stuck on the side of the road. The visibility actually just went to zero. He asked the bus driver to pull over to the side of the road, and when he did, we couldn't get back onto the road. One of America's busiest airports shutting down for two hours after an airplane skid off an icy runway at JFK Airport. And, friends, we're going to turn to some other stories now, and we're going to go over about our, our normal time. We're going to go over about 15 minutes tonight. You know, last night we were only on for 10 or 15 minutes. We weren't able to show videos like Caddy Kay said in her report and the one before this last one here. You know, when weather gets cold, her, her uh, electronic devices, smartphone and so on, freezes up, and so does she. And... Uh, some of our equipment sometimes got so cold it froze up yesterday. But we, we, we've got it. Everything's warmed back up tonight and working, except the camera froze up for a moment there while I, while I had the heater off. But this next story will relate to some of you who are old enough to go back to the time when Mr. Herbert Armstrong was alive. And you remember some of the world leaders he would fly around the globe and meet with. One of them was the King of Spain. And his daughter, Princess Christina, has been formally named as a suspect in a tax fraud and money laundering investigation. The 48-year-old, who is the youngest daughter of King Juan Carlos, and again, remember, some of you remember seeing the pictures, tall King Juan Carlos with Mr. Herbert Armstrong. And kind of sad that they're having this, uh, this problem. But uh, she appears, you'll see in the video, she appears to be handling herself pretty well. She's been, a summon, she's been summoned to appear in court on March 8th. Tom Burridge has this report from Spain. This is a long-running scandal. Every twist and turn of it has been covered in the Spanish media. And the royal household here has always tried to, tried to draw a line between the princess and direct, other direct members of the royal family and her husband, Iñaki Udangarin. He's accused of misusing millions of euros of public money. But the fact that the princess has now to appear in court in March in Mallorca will make that much, much harder. And this comes in the context of the declining popularity of the royal family here in Spain, and in particular the king. A year and a half ago, he was heavily criticized for hunting elephants in Botswana at the height of the economic crisis. And a poll in a leading Spanish newspaper out this weekend found that 62% of people in Spain now want the king to abdicate. And, friends, we're trying to get our camera back. Okay, things are 
a little cold here and freezing up. <laughs> That's not too bad, though. Um, from story with Caroline Wyatt reporting from Kabul. Um, an Afghan girl believed to be under the age of 10 and wearing a suicide vest. You know, friends, I tell you, it'd be so good when Jesus Christ returns and straightens out this world because you're going to hear in this report how, and this, they, thankfully, the news reporters have blocked out the face of the little girl, so you cannot see her face. Because as is reported here, she has been an innocent victim and was even beaten by her own father when when what she was supposed to do didn't work out, as you will hear. She was wearing a suicide vest and has been arrested by police in southern Afghanistan. It's thought she was trying to blow up a police checkpoint, according to an interior ministry spokesman. Caroline Wyatt has this report from Kabul. The child, just 10 or 11 years old, is the latest pawn in a brutal insurgency. It's not clear exactly how old she is. Birth certificates are rare here. But Afghan officials say her brother, a Taliban commander, gave her a suicide vest, telling her to blow up a police station. Her brother Zaheer and his friend forced her to wear the vest. But when she saw the river she was going to have to cross, it looked cold, and she said she couldn't. Once back at home, she claims, her father beat her, so she ran away and gave herself up to the police. The use of female suicide bombers remains rare here in Afghanistan, even more so the use of children. The last similar case anyone can think of was in 2011, when an eight-year-old girl was given a bomb to carry to a police car, blowing herself up. And it has aroused a sense of deep revulsion across Afghanistan, with many saying it shows a sense of desperation amongst the Taliban. It was shocking. Uh, in the family also, like my girls were shocked. Um, in the committee, in the parliament today, uh, the whole uh, MPs were talking about it. Uh, it's rare in a way that um, this actually happens by the brother. Uh, you know, how much brutal a brother could be to promote her, uh, his sister to commit suicide bomber. Uh, it indicates that uh, despite the fact that many people talk about a uh, possible change in the perspective of the Taliban, still that change has not come. Their story is also being used in the war of words between the Afghan government and the Taliban. And what will happen to the little girl caught in the middle isn't yet clear, though the Afghan authorities have described her as an innocent child who should be treated as such. Caroline Wyatt, BBC News, Kabul. Friends, uh, before we go now to the closing story related to the EU and Cuba and our brother Zebulon, who's involved, who may wind up being removed from the European Union, ultimately because of his involvement in Cuba against what the EU wants to do in Cuba. Uh, before we go to that, I've got a couple more stories we want to go to related to the, this extreme weather. We're all uh, practically over the entire United States suffering. Some not so bad on the west and in parts of Texas a little bit warmer, not so bad, but some parts extremely bad. And this alert has just been given to us that millions have been placed under a wind chill warning or cold weather advisory with residents told their skin could freeze if they go outside. And this advisory relates to uh, just a moment. Um, Oh, the Northeast area. Oh, you're gonna, you'll hear this in the video. I don't have all the notes here on this. I should have, but the temperatures plummeted uh, overnight. You have got it in New York and Washington D.C. by as much as 45 degrees. Here with this is Sanjita Maiska. The United States Big Freeze is getting bigger. 
Fog settles across Lake Michigan, engulfing this view of Chicago. People have been told to stay at home unless absolutely necessary, as plummeting temperatures promise to break all records. And those who battle their way through the snow have never felt anything like it. This is quite frigid. I'm not used to this at all. Put on several sweaters, two jackets, and walk fast. Road conditions are treacherous. Two states have banned driving except in an emergency. Air passengers aren't faring much better either. Four and a half thousand flights have been cancelled across the country, with 5,000 delayed. Meanwhile, emergency units have begun treating people with frostbite. Strong winds mean some parts of the U.S. have experienced temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. We're worried about skin, fingers, toes, ears, noses, that kind of thing, but um, being out in the cold temperature, letting the core temperature fall, can actually be life-threatening, it can stop one's heart, it can stop one's breathing, uh, and lead to death. Meanwhile, blizzard conditions have moved further south, forcing the mayor of New York to declare a state of emergency. Many schools have shut and motorists face dangerous conditions. Forecasters say it'll be another two days before these conditions ease. Sangeeta Maiska, BBC News. Okay, friends, and now listen, if, uh, David, if Kathleen has gotten away from the screen, go back and get her, because I promised you at the beginning of the program that I would have uh, what I feel is one of the best weather expert explanations of, of what's going on and, and why this cold weather uh, that is being reported as the result of a polar vortex vortex, a polar vortex of cold, dense air, and we've got that report from the BBC Weather Center, John Hammond, again, John Hammond from the BBC Weather Center explains what causes the unusual phenomenon. What's unusual about this setup, Anna, is, is that uh, the release of such intensely cold air out of the interior of the Arctic. Now, what's happened globally, in actual fact, is that we've had this cold air locked in place across the Arctic so far this winter. Now, now usually you get sort of perturbations in the jet stream, which help to distribute that cold and, and sort of water it down a little bit, if you like. What's happened this winter so far is that is the, the vortex, the polar vortex, has been very strong, which has meant that the cold air has been locked in to Arctic Canada for a very long period of time. And because uh, this time of year, air just gets colder and colder and colder if it's stuck in one place, that's exactly what's happened. So this very strong jet stream has kept that cold air locked in. And then suddenly it's been allowed to be released. It's sort of splurged out southwards due to various meteorological factors. So it's, it's the fact that the cold's been kept in for such a long time and now it's being released. That's the reason it's so remarkably cold. It's also the reason it's, why it's penetrating so far southwards. It's like a density current because cold air is dense. And so once it pushes out, it goes a long way. And so even, perhaps even more remarkable is how low the temperatures are going to get further south across the U.S., down as far as the Panhandle, we're talking about highs through Tuesday of around zero. Now, I'm no horticulturalist, but I imagine that's going to cause some problems to crops down there uh, because, you know, we're talking about 20-year lows, and I would imagine that places down sort of uh, Louisiana, places like that, down towards Georgia, northern parts of Florida, won't be, will, will be getting temperatures which they have not had for decades down there. So that's a, a major concern, I would imagine. We can also imagine what it would do to wildlife as well. Uh, the wind chill is the thing that really <coughs> bites at the body as you go outside. Does that wind chill also, though, mean that, well, it's the wind that's also taking the storm away from the areas that it's crossing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not going to last that long. It's, it's a quick shot. Um, by, the, by the middle of the week, uh, the weather system will have moved on uh, and the cold air will have swept out into the Atlantic and it gets warmed by the Atlantic. So there's a bit of a myth here in the UK that uh, what the, the US gets we get a week later. Simply not true because as soon as cold air floods out over the Atlantic Ocean, it warms very quickly. But just a footnote on the UK, uh, as I explained earlier on about this vortex and the fact that the cold air has been locked in, 
Uh, that's very much related to what's been happening in the UK and parts of Europe with the very, very strong winds, a strong jet stream. It's all part of the same machine. We've had this very, very strong vortex going around the world, uh, and that's what's giving the UK and parts of uh, northern Europe this sustained period of very wet and windy weather. It's all joined up. Adam. Friends, if you had your choice, would you rather have this cold air or the kind of air they're now having over in China with a big smog crisis where the air actually turns toxic gray. Officials in China say they are confident green technology will help overcome the country's notoriously polluted air. And will you see how bad this is? I remember in uh, Los Angeles County back in the early 70s when I was a student at a college, at Ambassador College in Pasadena, California, whew, whew, we'd have to run track some days when the smog would literally look like some of this, and it, we were so thankful when California passed anti-smog le legislation that began to get a handle on some of that. It would actually hide the beautiful mountains. I mean, you couldn't see those beautiful mountains on some days. It, were really high up in the air normally and on a clear day they just look so magnificent but in China they're having what the news lead in is calling apocalyptic scenes of dense smog that have recently forced major cities including Shanghai and Harbin you know Harbin's where they're holding the annual international uh, ice ice uh, show. And uh, Shanghai and Harbin have, been, have nearly had to virtually come to a nearly virtual shutdown. The BBC's science editor, David Shuckman, reports. There are good days in China, but look at one of the many bad ones. The air turns a toxic grey. The smog choking the streets contains gases and particles linked to asthma and heart trouble. The pollution, according to one study, may even be taking five years off the average lifespan here. So, to venture outside in the Chinese winter, these twin girls don't just need coats. Their mother, Jia Yi, wants them to wear face masks as well. Like many, she's scared of the air they have to breathe. There are so many people and cars here, she says, affecting her children's health. It's so bad, she's even thinking of moving away. You can't actually see some of the most damaging pollution. It's called PM 2.5 and involves particles that are microscopically small. So let's use virtual reality to visualize them. They're less than 2.5 microns across, which means you could fit 400 in a single millimeter. By comparison, a grain of sand is 20 times larger. Now, this matters because the particles are small enough not just to get into the lungs, but also into the bloodstream. Now, this kind of pollution is measured by the cubic meter of air. So let's visualize that right here. The World Health Organization sets a maximum limit of 25 of these particles in this space. He says we shouldn't breathe more of them over a 24-hour period, but a level of 200 is routinely reached in many Chinese cities. And it once peaked at 800, a seriously hazardous level. Until recently, some key facts about air quality were kept secret. Now, readings from monitoring sites like this are released. Public concern has forced the authorities to be more open. This is the center where the measurements are analyzed. Officials make sure their own air is kept clean. A purifier stands in the corner. The pollution over Beijing often gets trapped by these mountains. These are hot spots, including for that PM 2.5 pollution, recorded at a dozen sites here on a Sunday. The WHO recommended maximum would run right along here, showing you the severity of the problem. All right, friends, we're going to pull out of that story right there, and um, you can see in the background they've got a problem in China with that uh, 
with that smog. I want to end on a nice light story, and if you don't mind, friends, it, there's nothing, how do you say, nothing that ties the story of, of from today with such urgency that we need to uh, to play it now about the Dutch foreign minister being over in Cuba and uh, urging the European Union to take a new look at its relationship with Cuba. Uh, I'll cover that tomorrow night because at the same time I cover that tomorrow night, I want to cover with you uh, just who is the tribe of Zebulun. Some of you know, but between tonight and tomorrow night, I'll encourage you to review that. And I'll tell you why right after we play this story that I'd like to play for you next that uh, will make a nice light ending for us tonight. It actually is an upbeat story with a happy ending. Fishing on the beach when he was swept away by a sudden large wave. He'd been catching baby eels to make some extra money as his wife was expecting a baby. When he didn't turn up at the usual time, she raised the alarm and a rescue party was sent out. They eventually found him on Sunday, a hundred kilometers further down the coast. He'd been in the water for three days and he couldn't swim. But he was alive. Rescue workers said it was a miracle. We've never seen this kind of situation before. He drifted here from Hualian port, about a hundred kilometers away. He's got to count himself extremely lucky to be rescued. <laughs> then his wife received the news she had been hoping for. They could scarcely believe their luck. He said he'd clung on to a wooden coffin lid, just drifting in the water, hoping he'd be picked up by a passing ship. Eventually, the moment of relief came. I just happened to see some lights by the shore, so I began to tread water towards that direction. When my feet touched sand, I relaxed and was pushed by the waves onto the shore. A miracle tale of survival, but he's not pushing his luck. He's promised his wife the fishing expeditions will now stop. Marisha Novak, BBC News. All right, friends, and uh, again, one of the reasons why I want to push the story about the uh, EU and Cuba over tomorrow night is I want to tie in several things and take several minutes to, uh, to go over that story. Uh, the EU actually does a lot of trade uh, with Cuba, and because of the risk to trade with Cuba, there are many EU policymakers who do not like the speaking out that a certain foreign minister of the tribe of Zebulun has been doing. I'm holding back from mentioning who the country is. If you know who the tribe of Zebulun is, you know. But where, where could this problem between that foreign minister of a tribe of Zebulun and the EU, where could it lead? It could lead to the country of the tribe of Zebulun eventually finding itself out of the EU. And does that fit in with prophecy? You bet it does. The, the beast that the EU will eventually become is not a friend of Israel. And I'm speaking of more than the state or tiny little nation of Israel in the Middle East. The tribe of Zebulun have characteristics as, as Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, described them in Genesis 49. And tomorrow night, we will cover where is the tribe of Zebulun in the modern world. Tomorrow night, I'll cover the prophecy uh, on that in detail. Again, you may want to read up on that yourself between now and tomorrow night and see if you can find um, that I'm giving it to you straight or not. And, and friends, if I ever miss a point... I want you to feel welcome to tell me about it privately. I'll, I'll either agree with you 
or I'll explain to you why I don't. Recently, I had to explain to one man, and again, tomorrow night we'll be covering where is the tribe of Zebulon in the modern world. Thank you for joining me on this Tuesday night, friends, God willing, and that creek doesn't boil over behind us. I'm joking, I'm joking about the boiling over. I mean, I, you know, I even have fun with, and the creek don't, don't rise. We'll be back again tomorrow night with another edition of World News Related to the Bible and Prophecy and those special things related to the tribe of Zebulun that I mentioned to you on our Wednesday night edition of Nightcast. Until then, this is your host, Stephen Lloyd, friends, saying so long. You have Until been watching time. Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive. <laughs>